For the first installment in this series, I wanna give this sermon the title, A Need to Know Basis. A Need to Know Basis. You feeling good today? Excited for James Bond movie to come out this month? Nobody else, okay. Let's get in theme, let's get ready. Find five people around you, fist bump them, elbow bump them, head bump them, do something that is interactive on your level and then welcome them to Vive Church. Come on, let's go Morgan Hill. Let's go Austin, Texas. Let's welcome each other to the house of the Lord. In fact, let me ask, Kev, have you ever found yourself on a need to know basis? <laughs> on need to know basis, depending on the management levels within an organization or even the hierarchical structure of a family, being on a need to know basis pretty much means you're not important enough to know. Are you with me? Or are you still getting settled in your seat and finding out who your neighbor is? A need to know basis, that, that really is code for you don't need to know because you're not important enough to know. And we've got you on a need to know basis. So when you need to know, we'll tell you. It's not a great place to be. In fact, I, I experienced this back when I was in the restaurant industry uh, at, at particular McDonald's I was working at. There was a, a manager, a, a, a co-worker who got uh, elevated to the management position and was kind of power tripping. You know, anybody ever experienced those kind of people in, in the workplace? Just trying to make sure I'm sensitive with my sentence structure here. And she was power tripping a little bit. And one of her favorite sentences was this, you're on a need to know basis and you don't need to know. It made me feel real good. In fact, there are some things that somebody might determine you don't need to know when in reality, it would be really nice to know. I might not need to know, but I think it's nice to know. I remember this one time we were working at this restaurant, I called a restaurant, it was McDonald's and... Uh, and the alarm went off, the, the evacuation alarm went off and I'm sweating over a grill, I was flipping burgers, I was 15 years old and I'm like, man, didn't, what is that sound? And, and, and everyone's like, I think we need to get out of the building. You know, when you're having that moment, is this like, should we go? You know what I mean? And so we looked to the manager who got promoted and she's like, yeah, I think we should, I think we should go guys, we should go. And I'm like, what's going on? She's like, yeah, I'll let you know. <laughs> like she had any idea. <laughs> And we're standing just out in the parking lot, the, the assembly area, and it comes out. We're like, hey, what's going on? Is there something wrong? It turns out that what we should have known, it was a gas leak going on. Now, in that moment, I realised this is not a nice to know. This is a need to know because I'm still too close to the building, in my opinion. I, I would like to know. How many people are the kind of folk, maybe this is just self-evident, maybe you could actually interact. You, you, you like to know how many people would just rather not know. Because there's two types of people I know. There's some people who don't want to know. They don't, know, they don't want to know what's going on in life. They're happy to believe what the media is saying. They're happy to believe what they get. And, and, and there's peace from just, I don't want to know. I, I don't want to know. I just, I just, let's just keep going as life is. Let's just go along with the flow. But how many people really like to know? You're like, yeah, I just, oh, we're divided. This is amazing. Sometimes there's things that you need to know. Some things there's, sometimes there's things that are nice to know. Makes me wonder if there are some things that as Christians, we all need to know, but don't know. As a Christian, as a Christ follower, as a believer. And if you're not a Christian here today, I'm hoping that by the end of the day, you will consider becoming one because a life with Christ is really the, the essence of life to follow Christ. I'm giving you an opportunity today to prepare your hearts because I will present you with an invitation to follow Jesus and make him your Lord. But if you're not yet following Jesus, then you're completely excused from knowing some of these things. But as a Christ follower here, there are some things that you essentially need to know. You need to know. You need to know that Jesus is Lord. That's the first thing. You need to know that there is one God represented in three parts. You need to know that Jesus was born through a virgin birth, crucified on a cross, resurrected from the grave. You need to know that we're saved by grace through Jesus and through faith in Jesus. And you need to know that as a result, you have been adopted into the family of God, that you have eternal life and that you have a new identity as a son or a daughter of God. These are just some things that you need to know. They're not just nice to know, they need to know. 
Because everything else that you do for Christ will be framed from this understanding. I'm just giving you really great basic biblical teaching before we enter a series. Then the paradigm that we work from, I want to make sure we're on the same page. There's some things that are good to know, good to know. And there are, in fact, many things that we get to know that are spelled out in the Bible. The Bible gives us great illumination to things, things like our authority, things like our anointing and freedom, among many other things. In fact, did you know this, that as Christians, the Bible says that you are no longer obligated to fulfill the desires of the flesh because Christ has set you free from the bondage of sin. I mean, that's nice to know. That's nice to know. If you didn't know that, now you know. That's, you, you don't have to do what your sinful nature craves. There ain't no obligation. Just because you feel it doesn't mean you need to do it. That's what the, like before Christ, you had to. There was an obligation to fulfill every fleshly desire. But now that Christ has set you free from sin, sin no longer dominates your life. Therefore, Christ dominates your life. And you're not obligated to fulfill every desire that you have. You can submit it to the authority of Jesus Christ. In other words, you can resist the devil and he will. Good church folk. Do you know that while the Holy Spirit gives each of us specific gifts, the Bible reveals that you can also desire certain spiritual gifts. Tell, tell me that ain't nice to know. <laughs> tell me that's not nice to know, that even though your gift ain't singing, you can still dream about it. <laughs> Justin? <laughs> like you can still, you can still, and, and it's not coveting. That's good. Right. Coveting is in a different category. Desiring, the Bible says, desire spiritual gifts. So if you're really like, God, I think, I really do think my calling is to be a worship leader. Like, I really feel it. Keep, keep desiring. Don't expect the platform until the gift comes, but keep desiring. In fact, practice every Sunday right in your seat. And bless your neighbor. Amen. There are so many things that are nice. To know, however, that there is one thing that I feel every believer needs to know. It's not just who God is or who we are, but also what am I meant to do? Like if I'm a Christ follower and I know about Jesus, what am I meant to do? I should know that. You should know that. We should know that if we have decided to follow Christ, if we have given our allegiance to Jesus and we are a believer, a Christian, it should be very clear that we know what we're called to do. My goal is to make sure that nobody in Vive Church across the globe is in any doubt about what you are meant to do as a follower of Jesus. It is going to be completely clear by the end of our session today. However, I will make it clear that the Bible illuminates exactly what our, maybe I could put it this way to keep it in theme, our mission is. Our mission. Our mission. In Matthew 28 and Mark 16, just write, leaving some gaps here for the note takers. This is going to be important. If you have an operative, you want to write it down. It does not self-destruct, but it is important for you to put down on that paper we have what is aptly called the Great Commission. Matthew 28, 19, it says this. It says, therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And in Mark 16, 15, it says, go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. Anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved. Now, this is known, this little Bible teaching, as the Great Commission commission. I know this is fundamental uh, and probably elemental to, to some believers here, but just bear with us as we make sure that we all track together as the church. Because while you might have been with Christ for the last 30 years, there are some that have been with Christ for the last three days. And I want to make sure that we all know together exactly what we're meant to do. This is called the Great Commission. How many people already knew that? Why aren't you doing it? No, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> just tricked you. It's called the, it's called the, <laughs> uh, it's called the Great Commission. Not just because it's a great idea, but because it's the main mission. 
is greater than, than and, and, and it's greater because each one of us have a specific mission. All of us have a, a unique, specific mission that, that is specifically tailor-made for our life. In fact, one of the things that you've got to do when you come to know Christ is you've got to find out what your job is, like your specific calling in life. And it's always based on your skill set. That's a good indicator to know what I'm called to do. Know what you're good at. The good thing about God is He doesn't call you to do something you're terrible at. Do you know how I know that I'm probably, most probably not going to be an NBA star? Because some of you are taller than me while I'm still standing on this stage. So I don't have to be that intelligent to know that's probably not the pathway. But my job is to discover what do I have? What gifts can I have? God said, I can maybe begin to discover by pushing down that and giving it my excellence and glorifying God through it that maybe this is the, the way that you want to use me specifically in this life. Specifically, start, start with your giftings. Because some of you are called to be dentists and some of you are called to be designers. Some of you are called to, to do things in life and what you are called to do is aligned with your mission. But what you do, do it unto the glory of God. Do it with excellence. But what you do comes under the big do. It's a little do, do. And big do is the mission, the mission, the mission, the mandate of, of Jesus fits under the great mission. In other words, my mission fits under the main mission. Your mission fits under the main mission. We all, our missions, our specific missions come under the great mission, which is the great commission, collectively. So that means no matter what you do, we're called to evangelize our worlds with the good news of Jesus Christ, to evangelize. However, I wonder if it's not that we don't already know this, and it's more that we're a little intimidated by it. Especially that word evangelize. That is such a freaky word. Like evangelize. Can we put it a different way? Because I don't know what your image of evangelism looks like, but I usually put that in the category of a certain persona. The evangelists. You know, the ones who have no sensibility or self-respect. They don't care what people think. They're just crazy. That's the evangelist in my mind. And, and maybe you have a bad taste in your mouth from event. I do. I do. Growing up, we used to go street witnessing. That was, that was our exercise as a youth ministry. And this is back in the day when I wasn't even allowed to watch Ninja Turtles, but my mum was totally okay with me being from 1 a.m. to 5 a.m. street witnessing. I don't know why that was the time, because anybody out on the street was completely drunk, hungover, whatever. And, 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 and that, was my, that, was, that was where we had to cut our teeth in evangelism. Completely useless, completely hopeless. In fact, I had this whole like set, like these notes and everything. You know, we'd have to practice before we'd go out street witnessing. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Any old school Pentecostal folk here where you would practice on each other and you would, you know, do your, do your street evangelism thing and you'd get it down and then you got commissioned to go out. This little ceremony. And we got commissioned to go out. And I remember I'd be out there in the mall and uh, it's like dark, it's dangerous. There's all kinds of, and they'd leave you on your own. Like I'm like, the Bible says they, Jesus sent them out in two. How come I'm on my own? <laughs> and I'd be out there on my own. And, 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 and I remember this one time I was like, Some, something's happening. There was a guy sitting on a bench. He, you know, did smell like he had been drinking a lot, but that's fine. There's, he, he needs Jesus. Don't judge him. I remember sitting down and just kind of creeping closer. Hey, how you doing today? And uh, we started talking and I thought, this is the moment. I've got one shot. Take it. Let's go. And I began to do my whole speech. I began to do my whole thing. I'd just been commissioned. I'm ready to go. It was eloquent. There was no room for misinterpretation. It was precise. And I knew he was listening because he wasn't interrupting one moment. He was deep in thought. And we had a breakthrough moment because he began to lean on me. I thought, this wasn't in the training, but this has to be a moment we're connecting. And it got to the point where I offered him the opportunity to follow Jesus. Would you like to make Jesus your Lord today? Would you, sir, like to make it... He was asleep. 
Evangelism doesn't work. That was the, the revelation. And I don't know what your experience is of evangelism, but I I'm, I'm dare say it's kind of similar. So I don't know if it's that we don't know what we're meant to do, but I'm wondering if we're just a little intimidated. This is a frightening idea. Because the idea of talking about Jesus to my coworkers, that requires a lot of confidence. I mean, I mean it's, it's, I'm going to have to be consistent in my life to do that. And I'm not even sure if I have the competency. I'm going to need some of that training that Pastor Adam had. That's what I'm going to need, like a little ceremony. Because honestly, I don't even know if my workplace allows that. I don't know if my workplace is, allows us to, to, to that kind of talk. And so maybe it's, that we, it's not that we don't know our mission, Maybe what holds us back from fulfilling our mission is not what we don't know, but the unknown. But the unknown. I, I like, I know I'm meant to share the gospel. I know I'm meant to invite my family and my co-workers to church. But what's unknown is how they'll react. What's unknown is how they'll respond and how they'll treat me as a result. It's the fear of the unknown, fear of the unknown. Stay with me, church. Stay with me. In fact, when I consider the kind of people who do represent an effective evangelist, I think of someone like Paul the Apostle. Like Paul the Apostle is the optimal operative of Jesus Christ. In fact, I would consider Paul to be the James Bond of the kingdom mission because literally nothing stops him. Let's take this passage, for example. Not only has he been imprisoned, most of us would quit straight there. Like, okay, went too far, got put in prison for this. Uh, not only being transported to, for a prisoner exchange moment and to face court, uh, he's, in a he's in like a shipwreck, he's, he's in a storm, he's cold, he's hungry, and he gets bitten by a poisonous snake. But, but I love Paul, at no point is he questioning his calling. Some of us get offended and question our calling. <laughs> like some of us don't get the, the right parking space and we're like, I don't know if God wants me to be here. You, uh, you know, we, like, like here's Paul after all that and a snake is hanging like a viper. Some of you would see a snake and go, I don't know if I believe in Jesus anymore. Like they literally question everything from the sight of it, but it's hanging from his hand. And literally the Bible articulates Paul's responses like, get out of my way. Just shakes it off. Just shakes it off. Got no time for this snake. You know, like, I love that. Like, what a great attitude to have. I got, I got no time for, I got no time for this. I experienced this when I was an electrician uh, and, and I was a first, like, first year apprentice, first time on a job site. And, and believe it or not, if, if you're a tradesman, your first day on a job site is very similar to your first day at school. It's like you come with all the safety gear. You got your hard hat, you got your gloves, your safety goggles, you got your steel cap toe boots, and you've got everything, and you turn up wearing them all. <laughs> well, I did. I remember turning up on site, I'm wearing all the safety gear, ready for the job site, and I see all, no one else is wearing safety gear. What's, what's going on? You know, I made sure I got the good stuff too, and here I am walking around the job site in safety gear, and and, 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 and I'm watching these tradesmen who, I mean, their hands are harder than my gloves. You know what I mean? Like, the, these, are, these are tough men out here. And, 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 and I'm trying to get suited up for something. And literally, the tradesman's like, man, I got no time for that. In his Aussie accent, mate, mate, we got no time for that. And, and just, just like dialed in because he's like, there are some things that are going to get in the way. I know they're a good idea. I feel like some Christians are so busy trying to get safe about everything that they're missing the fact that just get in it. Uh, this is messy. This is dangerous. This is risky stuff. This ain't cute kingdom stuff. This is life and death kind of situation. Some people are going to get killed. All across the globe, people are getting killed for this message, murdered for this message. And we're trying to sanitize ourselves <laughs> so that we don't offend. Do I need to come down today? I feel like I need to come out. I don't know what this is going to do for the global broadcast, but, but I'm hoping that Chicago can still see me because I feel like there's a disconnect from up there to down here. Like I'm, talk I'm talking to your neighbor. That's right. I'm, talk I'm not talking to you, Sean. I'm talking to your neighbors. The the idea that there are people who are 
who are sanitized, like we sanitize ourselves to safeguard ourselves so that after sharing the gospel, someone might still like me. We're okay with them not liking Jesus as long as they still like me. I thought I would get a lot of amens. That's what I was thinking. Not even my staff are amening. They're like guaranteed amens on a Sunday. And even the staff are like, oh, pastor has gone too far now. But this idea that we sanitize the gospel because it's terrifying. And at the end of the day, I want to keep my friendship. Even if they don't like Jesus. They don't like Jesus. Oh, I like it over here. This is, this is, this is the amen corner. And so we've got this, this, this concept of it's a dangerous mission. It's a dangerous mission. Here I am trying to get goggled up and hard hat on and brace myself. And I'm, I'm approaching this from a, an apologetic. Not, not apologetics explaining, but I'm apologizing. Oh. I'm sorry to do this. It's, it's part of my job as a Christian. I haven't yet told you about Jesus. Oh, you don't want it? It's cool. No, great. Love it. <laughs> not going to Bible bash. That's not what I'm going to. So we've got these terms that are indoctrinating us, like the kind of Christian I don't want to be, but we end up. Not being light at all, but just a little shade of gray. <laughs> a little shade of gray. If this is convicting, it, I work so hard to make it convicting, okay? I work really hard. It's working. Thank you. Just acknowledge that it's working. Amen. I love this guy, Paul. Because like snakes are one thing, but Acts 14, you got, you got Paul and and Barnabas, these guys are just crazy. On their first missionary journey, you'll see this in Acts 14, they're ferociously out there preaching the gospel. They don't care. Town to town, they're just like smoking the place. They're preaching, turning people to Jesus. Got a lot of opposition, sure, but they just keep moving on from town to town. Well, well, they got like a, a whole group of people that kept following them from town to town, offended, and, and they're in this one town and Acts 14 records that as they're in this one town, this group catch up with them. They literally stone Paul to the point where they have to drag his body out of the city. They leave him there. And as he's lying there being stoned, presumed dead, the believers come out. I don't know what the believers are doing. Maybe they're praying. Maybe they're just like, oh, that's what happens when you do that. Okay, whoa, can't, can't do that. Paul literally comes conscious I don't know if there's blood coming out of his ear. I don't know what's going on. But he literally, the Bible says, dusts himself off and goes back into the town to keep preaching. This is, this is like, this is, this is an evangelist. An evangelist. He starts preaching again. I mean, Paul is literally like, I have no time to die. I've got to preach right now. Like death was an inconvenience because he was right in the good part. Right in the good part. But don't get in the way of Paul's preaching. We know a story where a young man, he was preaching one time in an upper room. Young man was sitting in the window, fell asleep, fell out, died. Paul went down and said, right at the good part, get up, raise him to life, went back up and started preaching again. Paul right. oh, ain't got no time for this. Got no time. And let me ask the question. How is it that Paul could have had the kind of boldness around his mission even knowing he could die. And yet we often find ourselves so timid with our mission, with so much unknown. He knew what was possible. He knew what was, could have happened. He knew death was a result, but yet we're timid with the unknown. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know. You know, I've actually realized something at a deeper level coming out of the, how do I put this, the season that we've all been through. From my own experience, from watching people and even witnessing what's happening in Australia at the moment, I've realized that the fear of the unknown is debilitating. And truthfully, one of the greatest mechanisms to overcoming worry, and I'll say this even as, to, as a parent to parents, is to play out the worst case scenario. This sounds counterintuitive because your mind is wanting to resist the worst case scenario. And I'm talking to parents whose kids are starting to drive and up until now they've been in your car. And now you've got to let them go out in the world and you're just like freaking out. You're putting on a brave face. I'm such a great driver. Well done. But the moment, 
they leave, you've got find my phone app. You're tracking everything. And they're at a stoplight too long. What's going on? What's going on? And it can be debilitating. It can cause you to get so stuck and uh, about the unknown of what can happen. Actually, what becomes very powerful is to, to play out the unknown. Play out the worst case scenario. Start talking about what could happen. It doesn't stop things from potentially happening, but it just brings the unknown into the known so that you can approach it with sensibility and prepare yourself for it, prepare yourself and your mind because the unknown is debilitating. Now, believe it or not, I have a suspicion that, that this is also Paul's approach to his mission to play out the worst case scenario because the unknown is debilitating, at least when I know what's possible and what's potential. I can approach it. You see, I want to show you. Turn with me to Philippians, and this is going to help you understand why Paul was such a great evangelist. And it's also going to show you how you can be such a great evangelist, how you can approach your mission, because in chapter 1, what we have of Philippians, Paul writing from prison, he's musing about what might happen to him, and almost kind of like a, a soliloquy, we, we get a witness of Paul's inner thoughts and it says this in verse 24, I fully expect and hope that I will never be ashamed, but that I will continue to be bold for Christ as I have been in the past. And I trust that my life will bring honour to Christ, whether I live or die. For to me, living means living for Christ and dying, that's even better. But if I live, I can do more fruitful work for Christ. So I really don't know which is better. I'm torn between two desires. I, I long to go and be with Christ, which would be far better for me. But for your sakes, it's better if I continue to live. Now, knowing this, I'm convinced that I will remain alive so I can continue to help all of you grow and experience the joy of your faith. What a crazy, this is not depressed Paul. No, man, I wish I'd die. No, this is not, uh, 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 no, no, this is Paul being real about the situation. I don't know what's gonna happen, guys. Like I'm in prison for the umpteenth time. I, I don't know if I'm going to make it out. They probably, this could probably end in death, but to really live is Christ and to die is gain. That was his perspective. See, Paul presents a completely a, a different approach to death, a completely different paradigm than most of us would ever consider, where in a very non-depressive way, he actually longed for it and knowing what it meant. This came from a complete assurance of where he's going. I wonder if sometimes our fear of death is an uncertainty of where we're actually going to go. Is that a valid thought? Like I know the Bible says this, but, but I also know me, you know, and like I know God is good, but I know me, I'm not so good. And so, and so there is doubt in him. Paul had no doubt. Paul had zero doubt. Zero doubt about what the other side of eternity looked like. He had no doubt that even if this does end in death, thank you, Jesus. You know, because the stonings, they, they hurt. But, you know, I'm, I'm ready to be in glory. But at the same time, he used the word, I'm torn, I'm torn. There is a big part of me that is so excited about the adventure of, of being with Christ. And at the same time, I know it's better for you that I stay here because I'm going to encourage you in your faith. And even my sheer existence and perseverance has to be encouraging to the church. So his resolve is that while I've still got a mission, I believe God's going to keep me here. While I'm still on mission, God's going to keep me here. And, and here we have... His resolve, and, and for the sake of the series theme, I want to paraphrase it. He had no time to die. Paul literally is like, I, I long for it, but I got no time for it. I got a mission to achieve. For Paul, death had lost all of its power because he, he played out what that would mean. And since death was no longer something unknown, it therefore couldn't hold fear. It couldn't hold fear. It couldn't hold fear. See, 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 it's the unknown that holds fear. Are you still with me? Yes. Right up the back, do I have to come down off the stage yet again? <laughs> it's, it's the unknown that holds the fear. It's, it's, it's 
unknown that's debilitating. It's, it's where fear exists in the unknown. It's exists in the what could and might happen and yet I can play out so many scenarios. But when something is known, it's not so fearful. It's not so terrifying. And Paul played out death, probably the most fearful thing that you could experience. Paul played out and said, oh, I'm good with that. That, ca- that creates a, a pretty dangerous kind of kingdom operative that is not even afraid of death. Not afraid of opinions, what people think or might think of you. That's got to generate a pretty bold, ferocious kind of Christian, an effectual Christian. People tell me all the time, I, man, I, I would get fired if I talked about Jesus in my workplace. Now, I know we're all different levels. <laughs> like so. So, yeah, and good way to go, in my opinion. I, I, I don't expect an applause, but then I know you've got like careers and you've got bills and you've got people to provide for, but trust me, God cares for you and He will provide if you prioritise God. Watch what He will do in creating a way. You don't have to manage and safeguard your life. I can't talk about Jesus because I would lose my job. God's like, talk about me and watch what I will do. I will promote you. I might even make you manager. <laughs> manager. Now, death was no longer something unknown. There was still certainly some unknowns. Like when would he be released? Didn't know. When will he die? Didn't know. However, what was on the other side of both options was known. And I'm going to say it this way. When what you do know is greater than what you don't know, there's no room for fear. When what you do know is greater than what you don't know, there is no room. It sucks the fear out of the situation. When you know my God will provide, my God will care, my God will, at the end of the day, even if this does end in death, I know where I'm going to be. I know people are going to miss me because I'm super important here. But, but, but it'll be good for me. It'll be good for me. Better for you if I stay, but it's going to be good for me. Such a powerful, robust, crazy kind of mission. And I wonder, for the sake of time, I wonder what it would look like in our life to have that kind of, approach to the mission that God puts before us. I wonder what that would look like. I wonder what that would look like. I wonder what it looks like in your life to not just follow Christ for you, but to follow Christ and lead others to the revelation that you've come to, to, to know that I've got, a, I've got a mission. And I've been wasting time on all the things of this life that I'm worried about, wasting time on how the world perceives me, wasting time on my social media image, wasting time on what it looks like and actually boxing myself into a place where I can't even move. And, and I've, got a, I've got a plan, Pastor. I've got a, I've got a five-year plan. I'm going to be at this company for this long. And I just got to, if I just get through the next five years and I don't make waves, and then, then in the next season, I guarantee you in the next season, you're going to be more instable than you've ever been because everything you've built is fragile. Everything you build is so fragile that I can't now break it because everything will come down. The best time is now. The best time to blow things up is right now. The best time is right now to say, you know what? I got no time for this. I got no time for fragility. I got no time for being basic. I got no time for staying stuck. I got no time for this. You know what I need to do? I need to step out and be bold because I know that on the other side of it, there may be some things that don't work out so great. But guess what? I am gonna use what God has gifted me with to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ because there is no greater thing I could do in this life but fulfill the mission that overarches my life. To be on mission, to be on mission, to be on mission. To, 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 it's no time to die. To be kingdom operative. Would you stand to your feet right at the back, everybody, in fact, because that helps me transition into a close and I do want to do this. I wanted to make sure that today I create a moment globally where we do two things. Firstly, as I promised, I want to create a moment that if you do not know Jesus yet, if you have not made a decision for yourself to follow Him and you're saying, man, this mission sounds crazy, but it's kind of like right up my alley. I I wanna live for something. That you've been existing in life, that your focus of your life has been for you and what you can get. 
but to know that there is an opportunity to live greater than just for yourself, to live under a great calling and a great purpose that is found in Jesus, then I wanna offer you the opportunity today to say, Pastor, pray for me. I wanna put my faith in Jesus. I wanna follow the Lord Jesus. And I also wanna pray for those that have been following Jesus, but you have felt on the sidelines of this ministry calling, this mission. It's like a mission has been given to you, but you've just left it. And today you're realising, I wanna take up that mission. I wanna take up that mandate. What have I been worried about? What have I been fearful of? God, if You would bring it into the light and bring it into the known, Lord, would, would there be a moment of repentance for staying back and saying, God, I'm, I'm in. God, I'm stepping into the mandate and the calling that You put on my life. Maybe God will illuminate people in Your world that are Your mission, that all this time they've been sitting right there for You to reveal the grace and the goodness of Jesus Christ. Maybe it might, it might mean some lifestyle changes. It may, it may mean some, some vocabulary changes. Oh, that's, that's too deep, right? That's like way too practical. No, stay in the spiritual. Okay, no. Like, like, you know what I mean? It's, it's like, let my life be a little more consistent to what I believe, which means I may not even have to say anything. They may ask you, what's going on in your life? You've changed. I don't know where it's at, but I do wanna pray for you. Whether in Austin, Texas, San Jose, Palo Alto, wherever you find yourself, I wanna believe that together as the church, we move into a new season season of effectiveness, season of supernatural growth because the people of God get on mission. The people of God take their calling and their placements and their positions and their work opportunities, their careers, their families, and they see them as the very mission field that God has put you in to transform your world.